I, hate, I really hope this morning you're doing well, but if you're not, you came to the right place today, the house of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that we can take this time to be in your house today. And Father, that we still live in a free country where we can open up your word and read. Help us never to take that for granted. And this morning, as I open your word and preach what you've laid on my heart, fill the needs of the hearts that are here this morning, as only you can. And Lord, I'm glad that you know every need. Every person who's sitting here right now, you know the needs in their hearts and in their lives. And I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to open up with a, a humorous story, but it's, it's not really funny when you know the meat of it, but it is funny to me. Um, Gene and I had a real rough winter this past winter, and several of you already know that because you prayed for us while we were out for over a month. Um, we both came down with COVID-19 at the exact same time. And in 33 years of marriage, Gene and I have hardly ever been sick at the same time. So it's usually one sick and the other one takes over and does everything and takes care of the other. This time we were both completely flat out at the same time. And that rarely happens. And one day uh, I got up and <laughs> I just started laughing in the mirror and Gene said, what are you laughing about? I said, come here, I'll bet you five bucks I look worse than you. <laughs> and we both just started laughing, looking in the mirror in pajamas for a month and uh, sleeping all day every day and taking pills and cough medicine with codeine. We looked pretty, we were sorry looking in. Uh, I won the five dollars, I looked worse. <laughs> She always looks better than me. But um, we both had COVID-19 at the same time. I had it for a month, she had it for two weeks. She was out of work two weeks. And uh, we had to keep testing each other, putting the things up the nose, all that nonsense. And as I just started getting over it and starting to feel better and feel like I could stand in the shower without holding on to the oh no bar, and um, just started getting better. And one night, my neck froze up and I couldn't move my head, my neck went into severe pain and spasms, and it actually hurt even to talk. And really, it, I'm an Italian and German, so I talk expressively, and it hurt to do this. <laughs> so Jean said, you gotta go to, the, go to the emergency room. I said, no, 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 no. It's late at night, I'm taking pain medication, and I'm going to sleep. I don't feel like waiting five, eight hours in a waiting room. And that's the way it is around here now. So she said, first thing in the morning, we call the doctor. So the next morning, we called the doctor. She said, my office is full of COVID-19 patients. I can't see you today. She said, but the symptoms you're displaying are bad. And I want to rule some things out. So I want you to get to urgent care as soon as you can. But the Zoom call was a long call of me explaining everything. So I was tired after that. She goes, now go to urgent care. So we go to urgent care in Burlington. They look at me, the nurse looks at me, feels around the back of my neck, I still am in terrible pain. And she says, you need to go to the emergency room because we don't have a CAT scan which you need. So that's the second time I sat through a visit and had to explain everything. So I said, oh, no. And Jean looked at me and goes, I know you don't want to go to the emergency room. I said, yeah, but we've got to go. They said, we need to rule out meningitis. And if you have that, it can be bad. So I was like, okay. Went to the ER. And I was in a lot of pain still. We finally get there, and after a long time in the waiting room, they call me in. Then the tests begin. EKG, well, you know, they stick all the things all over your body, and they put the electrodes on, which is painless and easy. So I didn't mind that one. Then they wanted to take five vials of blood. I didn't mind that either that much. I hate needles and I hate blood being drawn, but I can do it. And the reason it went bad is because the kid who did it went in my left arm and couldn't find a vein, so he was fishing. They call it fishing. I found that out later. 
and it hurt my left arm badly. So then he, they, they finally did it in the right arm and a nurse did it and she did it right. So then after that, I'm still in pain. They, I, get, I sit down again, they finally get me a, into a room, put me on a bed, and they said, now we're taking you to chest x-rays. And I said to the guy, I said, the doctor, I said, I'm beat. I said, can you wheel me in the bed? I can't walk there. He said, no problem, you're not getting out of that bed. We'll, we'll wheel you there. I said, good. They get me in a chest x-ray, there was a sweet lady in there. She said, I know you're in pain. They told me what's going on with you. Uh, I will make it so it's easy. I will lower everything. You won't have to reach up so high. She was super nice. So I get out of there, and I'm even in more pain because you have to put your arms up when your neck is frozen and solid in pain. And every time you move, you go into spasm. It's hard. So I get out of there. We get back to the bed, back in the room. Gene, I said, I, said I, I think I'm done. And I said, I hope that's it. Then the doctor comes in and goes, now the CAT scan. <laughs> By this time, <laughs> I had spent the rent. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. So they sent me down to a waiting area just outside the CAT scan room, and the nurse said they should be out in a few minutes. For that moment alone, I remember praying silently and saying, God, just give me the grace, give me the strength, help me to climb up on that thin little table that I hate on these machines. <laughs> And the guy who designed the MRI table should be shot. I've been in an MRI before. <laughs> it's this narrow, and when you're in spasm and pain in your back and they ask you to get up on that thing, it's crazy. So I said, Lord, I, I just said it in my mind. They wheeled me to a waiting area, and I said, Lord, I need grace and strength. And I just prayed silently, take my hand, Lord. Take my hand. Then they wheeled me in. And one of the two young men w was very muscular and big. He looked at me and he said, the nurse has told us that you have spondylosis in your lower back and we know about your spasms. We know you're in bad shape and your spinal injuries. So take my hand. That's what he said to me, he said, take my hand. And I just knew that was the Lord speaking to me saying, calm down, we got you, I've got you. He said, take my hand. He grabbed my hand and he was wicked strong, and he just said, look, I'm gonna lift you up onto the table, I will do it. He goes, don't even try, I'll do it. And he lifted me up on that table like I was nothing. <laughs> and he said, don't worry, I'll be here. When you're through with your CAT scan, I will be here, and I will lift you out, because we're gonna put your head, I mean, they jammed my head into this thing and put styrofoam in it to keep it still. And I said, I'm never gonna get out of this. He goes, don't you worry. He goes, I've got you, I've got you. So my point is this, when you have no voice, he is your voice. When you have no voice, he is your voice. It hurt me to talk, I couldn't pray out loud. All I did was pray in my heart. I did not speak out loud when I prayed. I just said, I need grace, I need strength. I said, Lord, take my hand. And the first words out of that kid's mouth were, take my hand. When we have no voice, he is our voice. If you know Jesus Christ this morning as your Savior, his ministry right now is to intercede for you. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God to intercede for you right now, right now. When you slip, when you sin, when you backslide, when you struggle, when your circumstances are completely overwhelming. Hebrews 7.25 says, He ever lives to make intercession for you. Hebrews 9.24 says, Jesus Christ is in heaven right now to appear in the presence of God for you as your great high priest. The very word intercede means to step in and intervene on behalf of another to help resolve an issue. Think about that. Think about what that means to your life. If that doesn't get you excited, we need to do something this morning. <laughs> <laughs> he ever, li ever lives to intercede for me and for you. This is exactly what happens for a believer when we pray. 
When we pray, Jesus steps in. He steps in, and he is our voice. He is our voice. No matter how bad you feel, no matter how overwhelming your distress is, don't you ever hesitate to come to the throne of grace through prayer. Don't ever hesitate to come to the throne of grace through prayer. One of my favorite passages is in Hebrews, so if you turn there with me this morning, lots of gold in the book of Hebrews. Uh, somebody asked me a long time ago, how much do you enjoy, enjoy the Bible? I said, it's, to me, it's like uh, searching for gold, reading the Bible. And in Hebrews, chapter number four, a very familiar scripture, if you're saved, if you're not, you're gonna hear some good things this morning, and I hope it helps you. Hebrews chapter number four, starting in verse 14. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in theological circles who wrote the book of Hebrews. They say nobody knows. When I was in school, back in the early 80s, in college, in the Bible college, they taught us it was Paul. And I, I hold that view, but it's okay if you hold another one. But here in verse 14, written about Jesus Christ, it says this. Seeing then that we have a great, remember the word great, high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hold on to your faith. Verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Think about that yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I could stop right there and close. You know what that means for your life? Do you really? Do you really know? Maybe when you get into trouble sometime, you'll learn. Because when I'm at my lowest point, that is so real to me. The grace of God through prayer, just bleeding out to God. Go to the Lord. I like this. This was written by Pastor Tony Evans. And I loved the statement so much, I wrote it in my notes. He wrote this. Prayer is the divinely authorized method of accessing heavenly authority for intervention in the things on earth. It's the believer's passport to the very throne of God. Why don't we do it more? Why don't we do it more? Go to the Lord and let him be your voice. Let him be your voice. When you're tempted, when you're in sorrow, in anguish, when you feel low, when you're weary, disillusion, grieving, when you're in emotional or physical pain, when you're in a trial, when your heart is hurting and it needs fixing, or just when you need some sympathy. Did you know he knows how you're feeling right now? He knows how you feel. Even right now as you sit here this morning, he knows every thought. He knows how you feel. He knows how you feel. Jesus endured incredible temptation, hardship, suffering, pain, all so that he could be touched with how you feel. When I thank God, I don't just say, thank you, Lord, for my salvation when I pray. I say this, thank you, Lord, and I do it on a daily basis for suffering the way that you did. Do you know why he suffered the way he did? So that he could be the captain of our salvation. That's in the book of Hebrews. So that he, he would know how I feel when I suffer. So he would know how I feel when I suffer. Uh, let's look at some verses in Hebrews chapter 2. So just flip back to chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews. He endured so that he could know how you feel when you suffer. He became a man so that he could know how we feel when we suffer. Starting in verse 17, verse two, this is a golden nugget. Wherefore in all things, 
It's about Christ. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He was made like us. That he might be, why, Jesus, did you do it? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Thank God he did. We'd just be wallowing in the pit of our sin if Jesus didn't die on that cross. And in verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. What does the word succor mean? It means to come alongside someone, to help support them in their time of hardship and distress. Think about that. Think about that. Kind of makes you want to go pray, doesn't it? It does me. Back in 1993, Gene and I moved to a city and started a church, and we started from scratch. Some mornings I preached to her. And she sat there faithfully and in, in, in amen. And one time when I finished the sermon, she said, honey, if the chairs could come forward, they would. <laughs> <laughs> but back in 1993, after a while, we did get people, and we even saw several saved, and we baptized two or three of them here at this church, because we didn't have a baptistry. We were a storefront. I had a congregation of about seven at the time. It grew after a while, but um, I got a phone call at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. Now, when you're pastoring and you get a phone call at 11 on a Saturday night, it's never good. It's never good. And this is not one of the worst ones, but this is a bad one. Phone's ringing. We're in bed because every Sunday morning we had to open that church every Sunday morning, no matter what. And we had no assistance, nobody else. It was just me, her and I. So I pick up the phone and I'm a little sleepy and it's one of the members of the church. It's one of the men that was very faithful and strong. His daughter was a drug addict. She'd been a drug addict on crack cocaine for many years. Her roommate also was a drug addict. They shared an apartment together. Good mix. Her and her roommate got into a fight over money. They got into a bad fight. And the daughter stabbed the roommate to death. She was arrested and convicted of murder in the first degree, sentenced to life in prison. If you could have heard the crying and screaming in anguish on the other side of that telephone at 11 o'clock at night, I had to pull the phone back from my head. He was crying and screaming so loud. I had to pull it back from my head and let him finish and then put the phone back. And this was the hardest part for me. He said, I'll counsel with you tomorrow after church. Right after church. Now when I'm through doing the adult Sunday school, the song leading, the offering, all by myself, I'm spent. And I have no problem at all counseling with a person right after church, but I can tell you I'm very tired. Because I didn't have a song leader or anything, I did it all by myself. And I was tired when church was done and when I had finished preaching. I, I am always tired after I preach. I just, I throw my all into it and it makes me tired. So boy, did I go pray after he hung up. I went to pray and I remember saying, Lord, help me. And when I said, Lord, help me, I could feel him coming to my aid. No, no bolt of light and no angel standing in front of me, just I could feel a little release inside, and I knew that I had to get to bed and get some sleep, because that really messed up my night, that phone call. I couldn't just sit in bed after it. I had to walk around the apartment for a while and get calm after listening to the sound of his screaming and crying over his daughter. And I remember I got up the next day after a very bad night's sleep after that call. I called an old preacher for some advice. I had prayed before. The old preacher said, this came right out of his mouth. Mike, did you make the 911 call? 
I said, what? He goes, to God. I said, oh, I did that last night. He goes, do it again right now. And he goes, and after you do it, when I hang up, do it again. So that's what I did. Our prayers, especially when we're in distress, are like a 911 call to God. That's what Jesus is there for intercession. The Bible is riddled with verses about the Lord Jesus Christ being an intercessor for you. That's his ministry. I remember the next morning, I tried to pray long, and it worked. And I said, Lord, I've got to give you this problem. I've got to give you this problem. Because I've got to tell you, there's not one thing they taught me in Bible college that would have helped me to counsel that man. There's not one class that I went to that would have made me ready to say something to this guy whose daughter had just been arrested for murdering someone by stabbing them to death. So I remember praying, and I don't remember everything I said, and I can tell you this, I was clueless. All I did was rely on God completely, leaning on him like I lean on this pulpit. And I just remember, after I was done with my sermon, I was spent and tired like I always am. But I remember being able to handle it. See where I'm pointing? I didn't handle it. He did. When the Bible says, cast your cares on him, for he careth for you. I used to be a weightlifter when I was a very young man. I'm 64 now. That was a long time ago. <laughs> but you know what they used to teach us after you did the clean and jerk? Cast it down onto the floor immediately once it's over your head. Drop it. Let go of it. Cast it down. And it would slam onto the rubber. On, to the, on the floor, on the gym floor. The moment you get the clean and jerk set and you did your lift, drop it. That's a picture of casting your cares on Christ. Drop it. Let it go. Let go. Drop it. One of the reasons you, you can have a lot of trouble in your life is because you're carrying it. You're carrying it yourself. You're helping yourself. That's not the way it's supposed to be for a Christian. And Hollywood loves to throw it into all the TV shows and the movies. God helps those who help themselves. There's going to be a time in your life, friend, where you won't be able to help yourself. And if it, doesn't, if it hasn't come yet, that's because you're young. Because I, I could write sermons for the rest of my days on how many times I've had days like that. Uh, not just days, months, months that were like that. I'm glad he intercedes for me. Think about this for a minute. When you have no voice, he is your voice. Jesus is the only friend you'll ever have who knows what it's all about when you are crying. You don't have to say a word and he knows. A lot of people say, well, I got this friend that I lean on for everything. I think that's terrific. But it doesn't match Jesus Christ. When, when I cry over something, like I did that man when he called that night, tears are a language to my Lord. Yeah. Tears are a language to him. He knows how I feel. I don't have to say a word. He knows how I feel. One more portion of scripture that I want to get into. It's one of my favorite in the whole Bible. When I was a baby Christian and someone showed me this, I almost danced. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, way back in the Old Testament. You're going to, right after the book of Ruth, you'll find Samuel. First, not second, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Those of you who have been saved for a while, you're already saying in your heads, I know where he's going. This is Hannah. One of my favorite women in the Bible. And by the way, I think women have some of the strongest faith. I know my wife does. She puts up with me. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 1. Hannah. Now remember this statement, and, and I wrote this. In prayer, it's much better to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. 
That's where we're going right now. We're going to a woman who was so devoted to God, she blew away the priests that were standing at the temple. The ones who are supposed to be all together for God. She blew them away. The power of praying women. Man. Now you've got to see this. This is a story where Hannah was barren. She couldn't have children. And you might say, well, that's, that's okay, I, I, you know. But you know what? In Bible times, you were, you were considered cursed. If you didn't have children, people looked down on you. You were cursed. People would look at you and go, oh, brother. And Hannah had someone who did that to her every year. And here it is, starting in verse 1. We're going, going to go to the temple. Hannah was there with her husband. Now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerohim, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. She's my favorite, by the way. Favorite woman of the Bible. And the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man, talking about Elkanah, uh, went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophnius and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, that's Penina, also provoked her sore. I read a lot of commentaries on this. This woman, Penina, deliberately antagonized Hannah over the fact that she couldn't have children. You ever have a bad family member or a friend or person at work that you can't deal with? It's in the Bible. And look at the Bible says, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Hannah was sad, bitter, and tortured, and she couldn't even eat. Ever been depressed or feel bad enough that that happens to you? I have. Verse 8, then said Elkanah, her husband to her, very understanding guy. Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid. She's calling herself a handmaid. Why is that important? A handmaid was a servant. And before God, she stood as a servant. She said, hear the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me. And not forget thine handmaid, thine servant. But will give unto me. Give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. In verse 12, And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunk. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. When was the last time you did that? You. Look at verse 16. Count not thine handmaid, thine servant, for a daughter of Belial, 
For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid, thine servant, find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way. I love this. I marked it in my Bible. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She already felt better before the prayer was answered. Make a note of that. Before an answer came, she felt better. That's trusting God in prayer. And in verse 19, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I've asked him of the Lord. And for time's sake, I'll stop there. Actually, we do have enough time, but if you read further on, because I want to make some more points, she later brings him to the house of God and dedicates that child to the Lord. She got something from God, And what did she do? Walk away and go, thanks a lot, that was great. No, 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 no. When you get something from the Lord and you know it's his hand, you know what you got to do? You got to go to the Lord right away and thank him. You got to go to the Lord in prayer. You get a big raise in pay? (laughs) Don't forget the Lord. A health problem is resolved? Don't forget God. (laughs) Don't forget him even if it isn't resolved. Don't forget him. Don't forget him. Hannah poured out her heart and soul to God in prayer. God remembered her. And I love 1 Samuel 16, 7. You don't have to turn there. I'll just paraphrase and quote it. Memorize it. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this. The Lord sees not as man sees. Thank God. Man looks on the outward appearance of a person. But the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. He doesn't care what you look like. He cares about what's inside. He cares about the heart. And you know, God's not impressed with a microwave prayer life. As a Bible college student, one of the jobs I had, I had many different things I did. Cameras, I worked at a camera shop for a while. That was about four years. I took a while to get my college through because I paid cash for all the classes, so I didn't owe anything when I got out. But I had to load trucks at night at Napa Auto Parts. It was heavy. I hurt my back twice in the truck and had to go to physical therapy twice when I was working there. We loaded trucks at night, 2 to 9 p.m. If you skip dinner, they let you go a half hour early. So everybody voted to skip dinner. I lost weight so fast, (laughs) like I needed to. But we still had a 15-minute break. We still had a 15-minute break. And during that 15-minute break, there'd be a line at the microwave. And if you were lucky, you got there first. And one of the things I used to eat on a regular basis, and Gene will remember this, was those disgusting Mashad instant microwave noodle soups in a styrofoam cup that looked like a Dunkin' Donuts coffee. (laughs) They were in a styrofoam cup with dried up peas, something that looked like meat, resembled meat, and dried up freeze-dried gunk. You filled it up with water and stuck it in the microwave, and in 60 seconds, voila! There's only one thing I could say about it. It was hot, and there was plenty of it. That was about it. But it was something to eat to keep you going. Now, compare that to my Italian grandmother, Rose, who made homemade chicken soup, loaded with vegetables that she picked out of her garden in the backyard, chopped up an entire chicken, and brought out bags of Italian spices and rubbed it all over the chicken. And my favorite thing, She loaded it with pasta that was shaped like little stars. And when you were a kid, it was neat. She simmered it for hours, sometimes almost a day, 
on an old gas range that had handles on it so big you could put your hands around them. Which do you think was better? Grandma soup. And she had a saying, eat the, eat the. <laughs> she hated skinny people. No offense if you're skinny. I'm skinny. But she would say to my friends that I brought on Christmas Eve, because she did a spread on Christmas Eve, you wouldn't believe. And the Italian lifestyle, Christmas Eve's a big deal. They open the doors of their home. They do not close the doors or lock them. Anyone who comes gets to eat. I brought a friend from high school, some of you know him, Mark Kelly. And he said, oh, when I got out of there, oh, because of how full he was. But she used to say, eat to eat to. It took her effort and work to make that soup. But guess what? It was made with love and heart. Made with love and heart. And so much better than an instant mashad noodles. So much better than instant mashad noodles. I'm only saying that to encourage you to get into your prayer life a little more. Get into it more. Put some effort in. Put some effort in. Our Lord wants to hear from you. You ever think about that? The God of heaven wants to hear from me? I usually don't feel too good about myself. I don't really want to. Sometimes I don't want to pray, but do it anyway. You know, when you, when you feel your worst, you need to pray the most then. And yet I've fought that before in my life. I've had times where I felt terrible about something, or I blew it. And I resisted to pray. I was like, what do I want to go to God for after what I just did? And every time when I went to him, oh boy, the difference in how you felt. Your countenance is no more sad. Kind of like Hannah. Your countenance is no more sad. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to hear your soul. Even if all you do is cry. Because he already knows how you feel and why you feel that way. Even if all you do is, is just cry over something that might have happened. Tears are a language to our Lord. Even when you don't know what to say, pray. If you do know what to say, pray even more. Good for you. If you know what to say, tell me. <laughs> because a lot of times I don't. And when I got that phone call in the middle of the night, because that girl had stabbed her roommate to death, that girl had been in our church before and tried to steal credit cards. Sad. I'll, I'll close with a story I want to tell you, I have to share with you. It came to me, I was so excited. Jean came home and she says, she just got home, she works as a physical therapy assistant, helping people all day. God bless her for that. And I've seen her work. And she, she came home and she goes, you look happy. <laughs> I said, you wouldn't believe the thing I added to the sermon. God gave it to me when I was walking around thinking how to close. Her son, the woman who committed the murder, ended up in Jean's Sunday school class. She was being adopted by a family member. The grandparents brought her to our church. Jean got, her in her, got this young man in her Sunday school class. He's eight years old. His name was Eric. Jean led him to Christ. She led him in a prayer and he got saved. He asked, he, he called her Miss Jean. It was so cute. I walked in there so many times. It was the cutest thing to watch Eric talk with, with Jean. And Jean came home crying one day from church. We were driving home. I said, what's wrong? She said, you wouldn't believe little Eric. He put his hand up meekly. In, he's not like the other kids. He's meek. And he put his hand up and said, Miss Jean? And she said, yes. Are we doing prayer requests like we usually do? She said, yes. He said, I want to ask you if you could pray that I just have a backyard to play in. I've never had one. And that I'd have my own bed. Think about that. In my lifetime, I never, there was never a time I didn't have a bed. He said, could you just pray about that for me? That I have a yard and a bed to sleep in. He was sleeping on a couch in drug addict's apartment. My wife said, we're going to pray about that every week for you. So, so Jean would pray, pray and mention it every week. 
Eventually, one of the relatives adopted Eric and brought him to Maine to a huge farmhouse where they lived with a giant yard and he got his own room. Sometimes we need to have a faith, the faith of a child. Jesus said that, didn't he? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm into a different sermon, so it's hard for me to shift gears sometimes. But uh, 64 years old, I don't shift like I used to. But he got, his own, he got his yard, he got his room. Gene came to me in tears and said, it happened. He got his yard, he got his room. It's a wonderful thing, think about it. And this morning, if you're here, and there's never been a time in your life when you receive Christ as your savior, I'm just gonna tell you what the Bible says because a lot of times when I, I, I love to tell people how to pray, don't get me wrong, but sometimes I don't feel like I say it quite right. I'm just gonna let the Bible say it. In Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, in Romans, Romans chapter 10, back in 1985, I knelt at a kneeler that was over here in this church. The building was much different then. There was a kneeler on the floor. I can't kneel now because of my back and my spondylosis, but I, kn I knelt. It was about the same height as the stairs. And a guy came up to me, one of the men of the church, and opened up the Bible and right here. And it's Romans chapter 10 in verse nine. And he said, you need to pray. You need to turn away from your sin, repent of your sin to the Lord and pray. And he brought me to this scripture and I've never forgotten it. I try to use it every time. Starting in verse 9, it says in Hebrews, I'm sorry, said it again, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart, how important is the heart? How important is your heart? Jean's old preacher told her one time, you can miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between your head and your heart. You can miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between your head and your heart. So pray with your heart. Don't think, don't think about it. Get your heart into it. So if you shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. And if you don't know what the word saved is, you're probably not. For with the heart, verse 10, there's the heart again. Man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, there's the prayer, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, I'm not saying it, the Bible says it. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call on him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. End of story. That has nothing to do with how good you are, how many things you gave to. If you're a billionaire that gave to all these great causes, that's a good thing. But guess what? That has nothing to do with whether or not you'll go to heaven. It has everything to do with whether or not you believed on the name of Jesus. And that's all we're urging you to do this morning. That's all we're urging you to do. If you want the prayer life like Hannah had, like, like I talked about this morning, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. For him to intercede for you, you have to know him. A lot of us were raised in religions, I was, Gene was, that never told us that. It made me a little mad. It made me a little mad. The first step is getting saved. That's the first step. And if you've never been saved, you need to do that. You need to do that. Oh, you need to do that. Think about your prayer life this morning. And think about when you have no voice. If you get nothing else, I want you to get that. Think about when you have no voice. When you just don't have a clue what to say. When you have no voice, he is your voice. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for what our ears have heard from the word of God this morning. It's your word. 
It's not my opinion, it's your word. I pray thee, Father, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, has never been saved, that they do that today, and if they would pray a prayer today, like in the Bible, just repent of their sin, say, I'm sorry for my sin, and just pray and say, Lord, I need you as my Savior. I need you. You'll die and slip into an eternity in hell without him. I don't understand why anybody, Lord, would turn away from you when you have your hands wide open this morning. If you're here this morning and you need Jesus, pray to him now. Receive him as your Savior and let me know before you leave the building so we can rejoice with you. And Father, I wonder if there are people sitting here under the sound of my voice this morning that need to give something in their life over to you and let it go and trust you with it. Something they're suffering, some form of distress, a trouble with somebody, trouble with pain. I know all about that. Talk to me later. I wonder, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if by an uplifted hand you might say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm going through something and I need prayer and I'm going to pray today, but pray for me. I see hands. Don't be afraid. No one's looking around. I see, I've seen over eight hands already. There's something I need prayer for. We're going to get that, we're going to do that right now for you. And you later on, you go to prayer for that. It's, it's, the preacher doesn't have a, a golden sepulcher to say, I, I'm a better prayer warrior than you. You go to prayer too for that later, okay? Let's pray. Father, for all the hands that were raised, I don't know what they're going through, but I'm glad I serve you and you know. Take whatever it is in their lives. Get into those circumstances or whatever's going on and come to their aid like only you can. And we'll thank you for it and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.